Joining us this week for the Political Roundtable are Ken Burns, reporter for WYPR Radio, and Brian Sears, government reporter for The Daily Record. Gentlemen, thanks to both of you for being with us. Thanks, thanks for having us. I mentioned at the top of the show that the state superintendent of education, Lillian Lowry, announced her resignation today. Uh, she was three years into a four-year term. Everybody's saying that she wasn't pressured to resign. But, uh, Brian, it does give the Hogan appointees on the State Board of Education the opportunity to decide on a successor. Absolutely. And I think maybe uh, one of, the, thing, one of the, the ways that he might have a hand in this is Nancy Grasmick served on the transition uh, committee. And I would assume that he would reach out to uh, the former state superintendent of public schools to ask her a little bit for her advice. A longtime former uh, superintendent of, of schools. Now, we've seen sort of a, a um, rolling series of changes in state government. Larry Hogan was sworn in uh, last January. There are some immediate changes, new cabinet. Now we're kind of seeing the, the second wave of, of changes, not only in the education department, but also transportation. There have been a number of uh, changes with the uh, air people who run the airport. Uh, you have a new MTA administrator, Paul Comfort, who was a longtime local administrator. Among others, you have somebody new running the MVA as well. One of the other changes that you have is uh, Henry Kay from Transportation, who was the, uh, the, the really the mastermind behind both the red and the purple line plans, uh, one of which is going to move forward. And as, as you know, the red line plan is essentially dead on arrival now. And, and he announced the, the, that he was leaving this week. That's also, correct, as of this afternoon. Also said he wasn't pushed. That, right. That's correct, but there had been talks about him leaving for a while. I had a conversation with him about a month ago about this because there were rumors swirling that he was going to be leaving and, uh, and going to a transportation consulting firm where a former transportation secretary that actually brought him back to the state works. And so uh, you know, there's always the possibility that that's still in play. One uh, position in state government that the Hogan team is not changing at the moment is the head of the housing department, uh, Ken Holt, who uh, said some very controversial things about lead paint poisoning. And it's kind of surprising because now you have a third of the Democrats in the House of Delegates, they want him out. The Hogan administration says we're standing by him, even though what he said was very ill-advised. But one could and, and what he said, Brian, you were there. I was there. Was uh, that, that some uh, parents are intentionally... Specifically, what he said was that he had he had been told a story, um, which he later said he was told by a developer, um, that some mothers, in an effort to secure benefits, uh, housing benefits for their children, will intentionally use lead fishing weights and wipe them around inside of their mouth to get the lead levels up, and then use that as a way to secure benefits, even though the homeowner, uh, the property owner, would not necessarily have been responsible. And uh, that, I mean, that was one of those moments when, when it was said, you knew that something had, you know something had been said that was newsworthy. Um, the reaction from the administration was swift. Um, they, they commented on it that evening. And by the next day, uh, Lieutenant Governor Boyd Rutherford was at that same MAKO conference in, uh, in Ocean City and said that they had no idea where that came from and, and said that their housing secretary was, and I quote, off the reservation. Uh, Lieutenant Governor is uh, in charge of the, the Heroin uh, uh, Commission Task Force. Uh, they're out with their initial uh, recommendations. What's in that? Uh, from what I read, it was a, a very similar to what the city put out, particularly the public service campaign. And uh, the city, they were putting out a campaign to help people recognize the signs of drug overdose. For the state, it's more of a, as the lieutenant governor put it, a just say no type of campaign, which is interesting because when he was police commissioner uh, until recently, Anthony Batts, he wanted to see more of that type of uh, campaigning back in this country. He brought up the old D.A.R.E. program that was around uh, when I was in elementary school. Excuse me for dating myself. But uh, just a few weeks ago, just course, a few right, weeks right. ago. <laughs> but uh, he's, they, he went on a, oddly enough, with his uh, now successor, uh, he was chief of Anne Arundel County, uh, Kevin Davis at the time, uh, along with uh, someone from Prince George's County and a federal official. They went on a mission to Columbia to learn where the heroin uh, trade begins. And they saw similar programs down there really r ramping up where in recent years we've kind of calmed that down. 
One of the interesting things about the plan is that a number of the recommendations in there are built to be done now. Um, they're looking at doing some things in the next, you know, with, literally within weeks. Um, they, they're putting $950,000 into expansion of, uh, of a drug used to, to treat overdoses uh, called naloxone. They're also putting $800,000, $850,000 into some treatment centers, and um, they're, doing, they're doing the PSAs. I mean, so the beds for the treatment center in Kent County apparently will the, the money has been sent, and those beds will be available probably within a few weeks. Um, I, I, there, are, there are differences of opinion, though. I talked to some people who are involved in the drug treatment community who were, um, if they're being polite, were underwhelmed. Other people were more angry about it and said that this doesn't go far enough, there's no treatment. The administration sort of acknowledges that this is an interim step, and um, there is the hope. I talked to Dr. Leanna Wen at, uh, in Baltimore City, the health commissioner there, and she said that she's hoping that there'll be more focus on treatment in December when a final report comes out. What's really going to be the sticking point, though, is how much money the Hogan administration is willing to put into treatment, which there seems to be a general agreement is desperately needed. So there's, uh, there's enforcement, there's prevention, there's treatment. Are there any new ideas here? In some ways, we're going uh, to—again, I'll borrow a phrase from the lieutenant governor. He talked about it being back to the future. He referenced, uh, for example, the PSAs and, and referenced the, uh, the, the Reagan-era Just Say No campaign and said that that was something that he felt um, had been gotten away from and, and needed to be brought back so that the public understood, you know, especially children, understood the dangers of opioid and heroin abuse. Let's talk politics for a little bit. Uh, the, uh, the, the big political news in the state, of course, is who will succeed uh, Barbara Mikulski uh, as U.S. Senator from Maryland. Uh, Chris Van Hollen is in that race. Donna Edwards is in that race on the Democratic side. The big question has been, will Elijah Cummings, congressman from the Baltimore area, get in? And we're still seeing mixed signals, would you say? It's, uh, it's tough to say at this point. Uh, roll Call said he had just under a million dollars in his uh, campaign account, which is a decent start if you want to run a statewide office, but April will come quickly, and the only sign that we have is this fundraise that he's going to hold during uh, uh, O's and Nats game at Camden Yards, and that's uh, scheduled for uh, September, October. And, and there, is a, there is a time element to this. Uh, you know, February is the filing deadline, and this isn't just about um, the congressman. This is also about who who might succeed the congressman should he decide to run. So the long every day that he takes to make this decision limits the amount of money he can raise, limits the you know limits a number of the decisions that he has to make. But it also limits the people behind him who may look to succeed him in that office. Uh, they'll have a very short timeline should he decide to run uh, to make a decision about running and also then about raising the money that you would need to run that race. Meantime, uh, Heather Mazier uh, this week, the former candidate for governor, endorsed Chris Van Hollen. Uh, continues to, to build an edge when it comes to money and, and endorsements at this point. He's an extremely formidable candidate. I think uh, you can look at when he ran his first first, uh, first election to Congress. Um, he knows how to run a campaign. He knows how to run a disciplined campaign. And he's been working very hard to shore up support, especially in areas um, that know him. Uh, getting the Heather Mazier endorsement is, is a primary example. And that will help him statewide, because the people who liked Heather Mazier when she ran for, uh, for governor, um, they really liked her. They were almost, they were almost rabid for her. And, and we're trying to draft her as a write-in candidate, and so um, I, I think that's probably a good pickup for him. And both will probably need as much help as possible, because outside of the D.C. area, who's Donna Edwards, who's Chris Van Hollen, and uh, the Missouri endorsement certainly will help. Ken, uh, Baltimore City government, you've been reporting, is deciding whether to sell something to, to <laughs> raise money, and, and they're looking at parking garages, they're looking at that big hotel that, that sort of dominates the view from uh, from Camden Yards. What's going to happen there? Well, if the mayor has her way, they will hear the parking garage sale bill that they that she proposed one year ago this month. Uh, you have City Council President Jack Young. He proposed at least talking about selling the Hilton. The only hang-up is it's it's debt written, and they can't sell that hotel before September of 2016 because of the bond deal. There's a lot of homeowners in the state who can probably uh, sympathize with what the city is going through with that hotel because they owe more money on it than it appears to be worth. And it's losing money, even though they say the cash flow is positive. Last year they lost uh, $5.6 million of 
the entire year as far as uh, bookings and everything. And this is a very underperforming hotel. They should have made at least a couple million dollars by now, according to analysts. It's a nice looking place. You could put up a nice brochure, but it would be, as they say, a short sale. That's exactly what I was thinking, actually. Right. As, as Kenny was talking, I was thinking of a phrase that some of my relatives in Oklahoma would use, and they'd say, that dog has fleas. <laughs> not the hotel. We're not casting aspersions at the hotel. It's very nice. It is. Brian Sears and uh, Ken Burns at WIPR. Brian Sears at the Daily Record. Thanks for coming by. Thank Thanks. you.